and started lambasting, languaging words and all that kind of stuff at us. And uh, he had his pistol in his hand that he was just going down the front row and kind of swinging at everybody. And he almost he got me in the face pretty good. And I just kind of bolted out of there and uh, he pulled that gun out and thought, boy, he's fixing to pop me. So I stopped. And sure enough, those two young soldiers who were more than 16 years old were able to yell, Rouse, Rouse. And this guy, for some reason, just let him take over us again. We marched on into town and put me in a basement of a building somewhere in this little town for the night. And we probably had by evening uh, at least 25, 28 people in that room, all prisoners. Was everyone talking to each other? Or oh, we were talking to each other, but a lot of them were injured, had burns or broken bones or uh, wounds in their body. And we were wanting them to get some medical aid. And all they could give you was some bandages, paper bandages and an aspirin or something like that. And uh, we spent the night there. The next morning they brought in litters where you could pick them up and carry people. So anybody who could walk would pick up one end of one and you'd put a guy, an American wounded guy on there. And we marched from that building to a train station carrying the guys that couldn't walk. Must have been six of us or eight of us doing that, taking guys on the litter. And they put us on this train, of course, we had to go through the town and everybody was doing the same thing, yelling at you and calling you all these kind of things. And finally, they got us on the train. I don't know where they put the guys who were wounded. They took the litters from us and placed them somewhere on the train. And the next thing I knew, we were on the train riding and going somewhere. Turned out to be interrogation center near Frankfurt. And that's where I went. Uh, they put me in a camp called Wetzlar, which is kind of an interrogation center. <clears throat> and that uh, was probably about two or three days of being there. And for some reason, I never knew what happened to any of the rest of my crew and, and didn't know until I got home after the war, of course. But my pilot, who had been in that plane in the front, bailed out and was captured and he said he saw me in where I was but I never saw him I was he said my face was so swollen where I've been beaten up and the face was black and blue and uh, so I never knew that he saw me he tells me that story today still that he saw me but uh, after going through the interrogation which is I don't know whether anybody's told you anything about that but when you go through interrogation with the Germans, what they do, we had seen a film, a training film, American train film. It tells you exactly what to expect, what you might get into, what you're supposed to do. Of course, you're supposed to give them your name, rank, and serial number. That's it. That's all you know. And uh, this guy that got me the, doing my interrogation, he said uh, he could tell where I was from. I said, I'm USA. You know where I'm from. He said, I know where you're from. I can tell by your language, the way you talk. So what? <laughs> and he finally kept saying, he won't know what, where I was from, what my mother's name was, and all that. Uh, name ranking serial. That's all I'm supposed to give you. know, three names. That's all I'm supposed to do. So anyway, uh, after this interrogation, he finally said, how about a lucky strike? I said, no, nah, I don't need a lucky strike. I don't even smoke. What is a lucky strike? <laughs> and he said, well, you can't kid me. He said, I'm, I was in the United States until 1939. He said, I lived in Buffalo, New York. Yeah. He said, so I know a lot about the U.S. And that's why he was put on interrogation. Oh, yeah, that's, I'm sure that's why he was there. And he finally said, opened up a book, said, I'm going to show you some stuff. He knew more about me than I did. He had me on the wrong crew, however. But they have a book that had a lot of stuff. You wonder how they got it. Did you ever find out how that? I, I don't this day know. I'm sure they had spies in every base there was somewhere. They got information. At this time, did you have 
Were you thinking about the future or anything? Well, we're thinking about what? Were you thinking about the future? Were you thinking about how you're going to get out of this? Well, all we knew was uh, their, their word was they're going to turn us over and get a stop over because, you know, we didn't tell them enough. So they put you in what they call solitary for a couple of days. And uh, that probably the guy they put me in with was a plant. <laughs> and he didn't ask me questions. I, I didn't know anything. I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> so after a while, they, first thing they did, they came and put you out and said, you're going, We're go you're gone. You're going to another camp. That's where I went. First camp was Stalag Luft 4, which is up in old Poland area, way up near the Baltic Sea. If you're familiar with the Baltic Sea, it's just a little bit south of Lith old country called Lithuania. And so, how, how long a journey was that then to get to there? Where you were? Well, see, I got there on about October the. I'm gonna say it was the ninth of the tenth. So that was three or four days, two days, three days at Westlar. About four four days on the train and to again, get were there. You, were you traveling with all, all with Americans? Uh, well, with uh, guards and a few other American prisoners. Yeah. Were, were you speaking at all on that journey? No, we did not. We we did not weren't they didn't let us get together. Yeah. So what, uh, what what were you? Did you have any? Plans for escape or anything? Oh, no, no. Kind of you're going to get out of this one. You, you knew you were in there for a duration, but you didn't know what that duration was. Uh, I would probably say at that point in time, you couldn't have escaped without being able to have some hidden weapons like a gun or something that you could have blown a guy away, but uh, how was, you couldn't get away because there's too many guards on the train. The train was full of soldiers. And then when, when you arrived in this camp, what, what was the first thing? What was the first thing they made you do when you got off the train? We got off the train. They took us to a camp, and the first thing they did, they pulled all your clothes off and <coughs> check you over to see if you got any hidden th anything. They look up your rear even to see if you have a compass up up your rear, you know, all kinds of things. Uh, and they kind of bang you around just to let you know they're in charge. Your, your relationships with the guards, was, was it because you're both speaking these different languages and different language. you're on opposing sides? Yeah, right. Was there, any, was there any point where you could see each other's humanity, if, if you will? Or? I don't remember that the, the guard on the train was anything. He was just, you know, doing his job and, and you kind of knew that he was in control so there wasn't anything you could do. So you more or less had to continue to hope when you got to the next spot or wherever it was in time that you could do something different. And of course, we didn't know what that was because we had no idea where we were going. Uh, as I say, they didn't tell you anything. They just put you on this train, loads you up, and, and you're there till they take you off. And that's really what happened. And when they got us into the camp, of course, then that's what I was telling you. They took all your clothes off. And I guess they deloused us, whatever that meant, uh, I don't know what they did that for, but they must have. And uh, I mean, they did, but I don't know what it was for, except I guess they didn't trust that we were clean. Uh, all, of, all, of these all of these stories that we hear. They, they mug shotted you, too, there. I didn't tell you that. They took a mug shot of you, a picture of you, and uh, gave you a dog tag. You had a prisoner of war, like an ID card. You had to wear a chain around your neck at all times. And again, it, it just seems so. The way the way you had to be when you're in the middle of all this was practical, really. Oh, you had to be but realistic with what you can yeah. do, yes. But emotionally, were you were you going right down? Or no, I was I was optimistic because I was uh, uh, one who believed that the war was going to be over a lot quicker than it turned out to be. Because <laughs> yeah. I knew we were going to win. I just knew that, you know. But uh, you know. It, it, it was longer than I thought, but uh, you just had to sit but I was an optimist, uh, uh, believing that it would be over sooner. And I, and I guess that's the beauty of all of the guys who came in behind me. They first thing they would ask, we'd ask them was, "What do you think? When's it going to be over?" They all were optimistic too. They say, "Oh, it's going to be over soon." Of course, that's what I said too. I said, "October, it'll be over by Christmas." Nope. <laughs> what did you get? A, did you get a sense from the Germans that they? 
knew that they were about to lose? Or? Well, no, they didn't admit anything until after the Battle of the Bulls uh, on, believe it or not, uh, in this camp that we were in, was way up north and it was cold, really cold that time of the year, snow everywhere. And uh, we had BBC news every day. We knew what was going on. Underground, we had an underground system that got the news. And we knew every day what the news was. And we knew the Battle of Bulls went bad. And we knew that, but we didn't even act like we knew it. And on December the 24th, they used to give us occasionally a Red Cross food parcel. I don't know whether you've ever heard of one of those. But anyway, uh, they made you, instead of giving that to you, one man for one week would be equal of a thousand calories a day. You could live off of that box of stuff for one week and you'd never lose any weight. So you'd hold your own. Well, the Germans didn't allow that to happen. They, what they would do, they'd take that box and rip it open, take what they wanted out of that box, they'd punch holes in the cans looking for uh, compass or scissors or some kind of hidden weapon or something. And so you never got a full anything ever. But on December the 24th, they came in and gave each two men one box, a full box of food. And you talk about uh, like a, you know, a banquet first class. You had a full, of course that was for one, should have been for one man. Two of us shared that, and that was like, you know, you couldn't That's beat that. Present, yeah. So it was really a deal. But anyway, when that was all over, then they kept saying, well, the war is, we're winning, you're winning. Now, we are going to be here. We got you. He said, when, when this is over, you know what you're going to You're not going to go home. You're going to rebuild Germany brick by brick and stick by stick until you re place Germany like it was. Okay, yeah, we believe you. Adios. We knew that wasn't going to be so. Or we already knew that the Battle of the Bulls had turned and was getting better. And how many, how many camps did you end up being? Uh, well, I stayed in that camp on, on well, we, we knew the Russians were coming because, like I say, we had BBC. Yeah. We could even hear the, the heavy artillery for miles away. We knew the Russians were coming that direction. So we knew that either they were going to overrun the camp and capture us or let us be liberated or whatever they would do with you, or the Germans were going to move us. So we had in each, each man, I mean each camp had four compounds, 2,500 men in one enclosure, four of them. And each one had one guy like one of us who was the go-between between the soldiers, the POWs, and the commandant of the uh, compound. So he was the voice for us. So we got all our information via him and our 2,500 people in my group. And so we knew the word was that something's gonna happen. Be prepared because the, the Germans are gonna probably push you out one time in the middle of the night and you better have some clothes figured out how you can make clothes or do whatever you can do to be ready to move. And sure enough, on the 29th, I mean on the, uh, the last day of January, the middle of the night, they pulled us out of my compound, 2,500 of us, middle of two o'clock in the morning, dogs, flashlights, I mean spotlights, bayoneted yards, dogs, out. And luckily for those, who had done what our man of confidence, what he was called, for, had got us prepared to be ready. And I had even made myself a, how I got the, the knit to do this, I don't know, but I didn't know how to do anything like that. I needed a hat to come over my head and cover my ears with a flap under here, made out of old yarn from a sweater or something, and I bribed a German guard to get me. And uh, I still have that to this day, as a matter of fact. And that was a lifesaver for the cold weather that we f were faced for the first seven or eight days. But, so when you were living in these camps, day to day, how were you living? Oh, uh, you just, you tried to do everything you could do. We, we could get out and walk around inside the compound. Uh, 
Later on, we even got uh, some American Red Cross stuff like a baseball glove and baseballs and a bat and a football and a basketball and all that kind of stuff. And we'd get out there and, some, and the weather was decent, we'd get out and do some of that. But the biggest thing you did every day was wonder what you're going to get to eat for breakfast, lunch, or evening meal. In the morning, you'd be lucky if there's a piece of black bread and some butter, maybe, and some ersatz coffee. It wasn't really coffee, kind of like chicory. And for lunch, you'd probably get a bucket of soup for 25 minutes. 25 men needs room, too. So you got one bucket of soup for 25 men. You got one loaf of bread for 25 men. You slice that bread 25 slices. And be some argument about who's going to get the biggest slice, you, you know, you can imagine. So we had a system to work that out, too. You had to, had to do, be ingenious in getting all these things done. And uh, you say you were listening to the BBC. So I guess you were, you were, you were following the wall and seeing... Oh, yeah, we knew about, knew well. yeah, you know about the geographical areas they were talking about, yes. Yeah. So there must have been a sense that more and more the, the war was, was coming. Oh yeah, the war was going to be in. We knew that, but how fast, you know, it was uh, like f from that camp thing, I wound up going to Nuremberg. You've heard of Nuremberg. And Nuremberg was the worst camp you could want to get into because it's overcrowded. It used to have been a, uh, an Italian prisoner warfare where the Germans had the, the Italians in there. And it was uh, overcrowded and terrible. So we lasted there till about, uh, I guess the, uh, must have been about, uh, I was trying to think the, the actual date, 16 days, about, about the first week of uh, August, they moved us out again. 16 days we marched on the road going to another camp because the British and Americans were gonna overrun Nuremberg. So we wound up going to Mooseburg, and we got there, uh, I'm going to say, I must have the dates a little wrong, because I had 16 days on the march, and from there, probably 15 more days before the war was over. So I must have got there around the 1st of August. And by then, how long had you been in captivity? Since September of 44, yeah. So then do you remember if there was any radio broadcast in particular l leading up to the end of the war where you thought, now it, it's within sight, I can see getting out no, of No, the only thing we knew was that uh, the news gave us indication.